Hello and welcome back. This is Unit 1, WJC GCSE Biology. In particular, we are looking at 1.1 uh, cells movement across membranes. And in particular, we're going to be looking at the three ways in which substances can cross the cell membrane. So this is diffusion, osmosis, and higher tier only, although I'm going to cover it in this video whatever um, active transport okay so when we looked at the labeling of I'll just do a little animal cell here so there's the cell membrane there's the cytoplasm where most chemical reactions take place and that's the nucleus containing DNA which controls the cell activities now you can see we've got this drawn here just as a simple line and its job is to control what comes in and out of the cell it's a lot more complicated than we've drawn it there than as a simple line if i go on to show you very quickly the diagram i've got for active transport you know this is way more detailed than we're going to need remember i said active transport is for higher tier students only I think it's worth covering though because it's it's a long way off before you actually sit that exam and, and your decision as to whether or not you do higher or foundation you could very well change your mind so I'd like to go through it with with all of my students really so you can see there's a lot more going on we've got these phospholipid bilayer as it's called but this bit these bits hate water these bits love water so they organize themselves in this way and then we've got these proteins that can actually span the membrane and they can allow the passage of certain substances in and out now some substances are so tiny they don't need the proteins they can just diffuse across and we're going to go through each of these in turn but i do think it's worth bearing in mind that it is a lot more complicated than this complicated than this simple line that we've currently drawn previously okay so diffusion as a passive process where substances move from an area of high concentration to an area of low. Osmosis being the specific, specific diffusion of water across a selectively permeable membrane. And then active transport, which requires energy. It's active and it always goes against a concentration gradient. So it goes against the wrong way in terms of diffusion. Okay. So that membrane, which I've I've drawn there the, the tiny little holes you can see they should really be big enough to allow these these bits through. so if the red circles are water for example you can see they can freely move either way and they can move both directions because of the random movement of particles they will be whizzing around and moving all over the place and given enough time they will spread out eventually so that you get a roughly even number on either side of that membrane provided there is enough movement so diffusion there's no energy required it is completely passive okay it just happens naturally and it goes from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration okay so if you're looking at the concentration there I mean I haven't counted these but you'd expect over time for them to sort of be roughly even although obviously depending on when you take your snapshot there might be more on one side or on the other okay now I've called that a semi permeable membrane there the specification uses the terminal terminology selectively permeable so we're probably better off sticking to that rather than semi permeable although it means the same things these particles can freely get through but if I had some particles this sort of size if I had some big proteins for example then clearly that's not going to fit through the, the the holes in the permeable membrane that you can see there now there are many examples of where diffusion is important particularly in respiration where we've got to keep oxygen levels as high as possible in the lungs atmospheric oxygen 20.9 percent or 21 percent and provided we keep breathing in and out if this was the in the lungs for example in the blood oxygen levels would be around 17 percent so there's a high concentration to low it's going to diffuse into the blood so if we keep breathing in and out then that's going to happen carbon dioxide which is a waste product of respiration is in blood something like three percent 
and in the atmosphere 0.03%. So again, it's going to go the opposite way. High concentration in the blood, low concentration in the lungs. It's provided we keep breathing in and out. It's going to diffuse out in a manner that we that we need because obviously these, we need to get rid of this as a waste product. So diffusion and that maintenance of this these high to low concentrations or gradients are very very important inside the human body. Well, in, in all organisms, I should say. Now osmosis. If you if you took away the the membrane from beaker A here, for example, if water diffused from this side to this side with no membrane, then that's just diffusion. But if we if we drop in a, a selectively permeable membrane, as the specification states, um, and water is now diffusing across a membrane, then we don't call that diffusion anymore, we call it osmosis. So it's very specific. It's the diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane and therefore that is osmosis. Now, if we, I've, I've, I've drawn this, we can't see the water particles, but if you can imagine the water particles are free to move across this membrane, so they can go left to right, they can go right to left. But these sugar molecules, which I've just drawn very simply as these white circles, can you see that they're not free to move across that membrane? So although these guys in a high concentration would love to diffuse this way, they can't. They're prevented from doing that by our selectively permeable membrane. But the water can move either way. Okay. Now, the water will diffuse from an area of high water, or, or you could call that a low solute. I've drawn this with no sugar molecules here at all. So there's very few sugar molecules this side, but there's lots and lots this side. So this is high water, low solute, and this side is low water and high solute because there's lots of these sugar molecules dissolved. So the water will move across, will by osmosis into this side. And I've tried to show that representing there to actually to, we, to reach a point of equilibrium where the solute to water particles would be equal. So maybe I should have put a few sugar molecules in there to make it really obvious. Okay. Now both diffusion and osmosis, you'll probably look at this experimentally using this stuff called viskin tubing, also known as dialysis tubing, which is basically a rubber tube with tiny, tiny holes in there, just like a selectively permeable membrane. And what you will do, for example, you could investigate diffusion with different concentrations or different temperatures. You could also look at osmosis, where if you can imagine the red dots were water particles, because there's a, a low solute, solute concentration in the water and a high within the tube, then they would move into the tube and they would actually cause the tube to start to, to swell out, to swell up, okay? And sometimes they even, do an experiment, which is, well, I'll certainly be planning this for my class. We have a little tube there at the top. So that's not tight. It goes around a tube with an elastic band. And you can actually get the fluid, get the water to actually rise up the tube. And you can measure how high it rises to actually demonstrate the, the strength of that osmosis or how, how far that osmosis has taken place. And you can train, change such things, as I've already said, as the, the concentration of the various substances, you could look at temperature, temperature, sorry. Um, and um, it, it's very likely that you'll do these experiments in, in class. Particularly as well, will you use this when it comes to look at enzymes, which would be the subject of the next video that I plan to do, where we could actually, for example, use starch being broken down into sugar because starch can't cross across our selective permeable membrane, but the sugar can. So you could actually use that to look at uh, enzyme action as well and investigate how, how quickly enzymes are working in a particular experiment. So I just wanted to mention that, that viskin tubing, this very fiddly stuff trying to tie knots in the end of either end of that, by the way, but uh, you will definitely be using that within class at some point. Okay, so just to recap, diffusion is passive, it's 
the movement of particles from an area of high to low concentration across a selectively permeable membrane. Osmosis is the specific diffusion of water across a se selectively permeable membrane. And if you're going to do some experiments on that, it'll probably involve Viscin tubing. Okay. Now, the final topic, as I said, this is listed as higher tier, but my advice is to get involved with this because you don't know what tier you're going to be doing just yet, I wouldn't have thought. This is the transport of substances from an area of low concentration. So if I was looking at these square stroke diamond shapes there, they're in a low concentration this side of the membrane and they're in a high concentration this side of the membrane. But we want more of them. I mean, this is the case, for example, with root hair cells when you're looking at nitrate ions. There's more nitrate inside the plant cell than there is in the soil, most likely. But the plant still wants it. It'll have the tendency to try and diffuse out, but it's going to want as much as that nitrate to make amino acids, to make proteins and therefore grow and to make various substances within the plant. It's going to want to get hold of this stuff. Okay. The way it does this is we have these specific proteins inside the membrane and it's just incredible to behold really that if we input a little bit of energy from respiration in the form of ATP more of this later by the way but suffice to say that this is a, a, a wonderful little molecule that can transport energy around in the form of high energy bonds if we get some of that energy to this protein it actually causes a shape change in the protein. And as it changes shape, it'll pick up one of these substances, whatever this might be, whether it's nitrate or sugar in the small intestine, wherever it is, and it'll take it from the side of low concentration to the area of high. So you get even more in. So what we've got to remember with active transport is it's against the concentration gradient and that it requires energy. Okay? mentioned there the case of sugar in the small intestine I mean the sugar content inside your blood should be around four to seven millimoles oops per liter that's what it should be maintained at really and unless you're having a packet of Haribo's and a Mars bar for lunch the sugar levels in your small intestine will unlikely be be higher than that so diffusion won't won't do it necessarily. So we're going to use active transport in the small intestine. So it's going to pick up sugar from inside the small intestine to actually put that into the blood, ready to move around for all of ourselves to carry out respiration, which we will discuss later on when we come to look at that topic. Okay, so if I just go back to the specification statements, just make sure we're, whoops, we're happy with all of that. I went the wrong way then. Um, so diffusion is the movement of substances down a concentration gradient. Um, we've mentioned the use of viscin tubing, so hopefully you'll be doing that in class. But it's a passive process, there's no energy input required there at all. We've mentioned oxygen and carbon dioxide as examples from respiration. Osmosis being the specific diffusion of water through a selectively permeable membrane from a region of high to low concentration to an area of low water high solute concentration and then finally as I said it is higher tier but I think we should cover it anyway active transport which is active meaning it needs energy where substances can enter cells against the concentration gradient